So at this time of the year, uh, people often make New Year's resolutions, and uh, many of them involve uh, finding a solution to the, the guilt of overeating uh, over the Christmas period. And so we're going to be running two miles a day, and we're going to go to the gym, and we're going to do all these wonderful things uh, in order to get back into shape and that. And there's no real problem with that, uh, whatever, if, if, that's, if that's what tickles your fancy, okay. But I think there are more important things out there, obviously. Uh, there are definitely more serious issues and things that we can put our time into. Uh, I remember years ago, I, when I used to go, when we used to go visit our granny, that's my, my mom's mom, uh, God rest her, when we used to go visit her, it was, it was quite a long drive for us as kids, you know, getting into the car, and it was like, it was country roads the whole way between Thurlis and Ballylanders, you know, in through Holy Cross, and it was just windy, rotten roads, so as, as a child, when you're in the back of the car, it's like, are we there yet, are we there yet, and it was always this long trip, and then when we got there, her house was in the middle of nowhere, like there was nothing around at all. Uh, and then there was just always this hanging smell of a coal fire. And it was just, uh, for, for me as a child, it was kind of miserable, if I'm honest, going to visit them. Uh, but then in my teens, and then of course Granny, yeah, when she would talk, she would talk about things that I, I just had, I just didn't understand. You know, she'd talk about yesteryear and all of these things that used to happen back in the past. And pff, sure, as a 10 year old, I mean, it meant nothing to me. You know, I just, I had, I just didn't understand her really. Uh, but then, in my teens, uh, we got talking about things that I suppose I was getting interested in, like Irish history, right? And uh, the various, how should I say, um, efforts that were made to attain Irish freedom back in the day. So she was talking about her grandfather, who uh, would have, how can I say this without getting my family arrested? Um, who would have worked in various ways in order to assist Irish freedom. <laughs> so she had all these stories about, uh, you know, the, the, how, you know the, the, the black and tans, okay, and, and, and that kind of thing, and, and how her grandfather would have helped people avoid the, getting caught by the, the tans and that. Just very, very interesting, very interesting things. It was just fa fascinating stories, absolutely fascinating stuff. And I just found it really interesting. It just, just struck me then, uh, as a 15-year-old, uh, I don't know her. I don't know my granny at all. I mean, she has this, this really interesting side. I mean, when she, when she talked about baking or cooking, I mean, she's gone completely over my head, it's completely boring. Uh, but when she started talking about uh, the 1920s, you know, the, the 1910s, 1920s, that kind of era there herself and her, 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 her folks, how they lived it, how they experienced it, uh, just absolutely fascinating stuff. It just struck me that I don't, I don't know, I don't know her. I didn't know her. I haven't known her for so long. When it comes to our faith, I think it's something that, that we, we do mention quite a bit here. But I think there's always a danger that we might think we know the Lord, but, but, but not know him at all. Uh, this, this God who is so infinitely loving and infinitely good, can we say we know him? Like, can, can you say you know Jesus? Just, there's always a, a danger that we externalize our faith so much that our, our faith has to do with, with things I do. So, do you know the Lord? And the answer will be, I sing in the choir. You sing in the choir, that's great. Keep doing that. It's not what I asked, though. I asked, do you know Jesus? Well, I'm a Eucharistic minister. Again, that, that's um, okay, but that's not what I asked. I asked, do you know the Lord? I don't ask what you do. I asked, do you know him? Do you know his heart? Or is that even a goal? Are, are you trying to know his heart? Or are you happy enough doing something in the church? I'm sacristan. Again, if you're sacristan, wonderful. Keep doing your sacristan thing. But that's not what I asked. Do you know the Lord? I've been to Medjugorje every year for the last 20 years. That's fine, great, please keep doing that. But do you know him? It's a different, uh, that this is a, it's a different question altogether. Like, it's not what do you do, but do you know him? Because the, 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 the danger, as, as I say, is that we just, we just focus on the externals and, and completely forget the heart. And this can happen, me as a priest, it can happen to us as religious as well, that, that we're so focused on, on our mission and doing our thing that we actually 
neglect our relationship with him. So, do you know the Lord? Well, I go to Mass every Sunday. Again, please do keep doing that if that's possible. I won't go into it. But please, uh, uh, if you can at all, if it's legal in your country, go. Uh, but but, but the, 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 the much deeper question isn't so much what we do on the outside, but if we actually know his heart. And like, as I say, for me as a priest, this is something I have to be careful of because so often, uh, I remember a, a priest, a Dominican friend of mine, he, he covered for me uh, a couple of months ago for a week and he said, you know, sometimes we can be so busy uh, serving the Lord that we begin to resent it <laughs> or resent him. You know, we're so busy doing things for him. There's a kind of an expression in, 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 in Catholic circles, you know, that we shouldn't be so busy about the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. But he was saying, sometimes we can be so busy about the, the work of the Lord that we start to resent the Lord of the work. You know, we're so busy doing things for him that we actually are so focused on the jobs that we forget him who's behind all of it. I can... Can you say you know him? Can you say you know his heart? This is something that, that for, for me, me, for myself, I, I want to grow in this this year. You know, I mean, I, I don't just want to kind of preach or, you know, uh, re reflect on, on the Gospels of the day and, 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 and do my priestly duty. That's, that's fine and I, I, I should do that. That's my responsibility here. But that's not really the goal of why I'm here at all. The goal of why I'm here as a priest is to get to know his heart. Prepare myself for heaven too. A priest said to me years ago, it, it, was, a, it was an interesting conversation, it wasn't the easiest of conversations, but he said to me, he said, the Lord has given you a lot. And he said, and he would give you so much more if you would just be faithful to what he has given you. And it just, it struck me like a knife in the heart. The Lord has given you a lot and he would give you much, much more if you would just be faithful to what he has given you. So this year, I, 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 for myself, there's something I really, I, I really consciously want to do. Uh, not just be busy about the, the, the work of the Lord, but to actually get to know him who's behind it all. Otherwise, I've missed the point. I remember years ago in, in our philosophy class, the introduction to philosophy, don't worry, this won't be one of those homilies, but uh, it was a, a very, he was a very good professor. He, he made philosophy interesting. And he drew a big XY graph uh, on, the, on the board. <clears throat> and he said, each person, right, there, there are four, we'll say, when we look at each person, there are four kind of dimensions to each person, right? There's the, the plus plus, right? This is all backwards now for ye. The, the plus, plus sections of X, X and Y are both plus. These are the parts that I know about myself, X, and others know about me, Y. So everyone, people, I know I play guitar, people know I play guitar, right? Good. Then there are parts that I don't know about myself that other people know. Sometimes people looking at, at you will see something that you just don't see in yourself. You know, I just, people might see, Ginny, she's so giving or serving or loving, whereas you see in yourself, oh, I'm useless, I'm awful, I'm terrible. But they see the good that you don't see. Then there's a part that no one sees. I don't know about myself and others don't know about me. There's this, like, this hidden ability or gift that hasn't been discovered yet. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's because we're young or we're children and, and we haven't discovered these, these gifts yet. Or maybe we, 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 you know, before you become a mom, you, you never knew you were capable of such selflessness and giving. <clears throat> or as a, as a father... You never knew you're, you're, you're capable of, of putting your hobbies and habits aside for love of your family. So these, these unknown things. And then there are parts that others know about us that we don't know. Sorry, the, the parts of ourselves that only we know. That we know that others don't know about us. So at times we're actually even a mystery to ourselves. You know, we're, we're capable of more than we believe at times. Uh, there's more good in us than, than, than we're aware of at times. At times there, 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 there are these hidden abilities, gifts, openness to virtue that we haven't, simply haven't discovered yet. So if we're a mystery to ourselves, how much more is God a mystery to us who is infinitely greater than us, infinitely more than we could ever comprehend? So this year, rather than focusing on our, our bellies and how wobbly they are, uh, 
Why not focus on something much, much more important? Where are we headed? When, when the chips are down, like, and when, when all of this life is over and all of the things that we consider important at the moment, when all these things have passed and when our iPhone 12s or whatever we're up to, when they've all gone dead and they're replaced by an iPhone 15 virtual reality headset, who knows what's the next technological thing that's coming down the line, when all of that has passed, like, and when the jeans you're wearing or the shoes you're wearing or the handbag you're carrying makes no difference at all to you. And we're standing before the Lord. What would you change? When you're standing before him and you're looking back at your life, what would you change? Remember during the week, uh, I mentioned this uh, little interview that I saw with nurses from the NHS, the National Health Care Service in, in, in England, and they were, uh, they were asked, what did patients say to you just as, as, as they were dying? And as I, say, I was shocked, absolutely shocked by the answers, because the answers weren't these groundbreaking, huge, revelatory uh, statements about, well, I would have, you know, uh, completely changed my life. I would have spent more time with the family. Many of the patients at the end of their life <clears throat> asked for a cup of tea or that their favorite dog would come visit them or that they could watch, you know, an episode of Carnation Street. Or the answers were just so ordinary. I found it actually astounding that even at the end of their lives, people didn't think of a bigger picture, these kind of what we call eschatological realities, the, the realities that await us after this life. They just, they, they, they ended their lives as they lived their lives. There wasn't this, this, this great change of mentality or mindset at the end of the, they ended their lives as they lived them. And so for each one of us, I'm, guess, I'm guessing it's gonna be the same. We will probably end our lives as, as we have lived them. So it's important now that we start living our lives heaven-bound, oriented towards God. So that power is in your hands. What do you do with your time? How much time do we give him? And uh, am I willing to open myself to an, a new kind of a relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship, not just, just that I've done things for him, but that I know him. And how will I know him? I will know him by spending time with him, but not just, you know, you can spend time sitting in the same room as someone that, that, that it's not, that's not going to help you get to, know, to get to know them. You get to know someone by talking to them and by listening to them. This two-way two communication, two-way. I speak to them, yes, I have my intentions and things, but I also listen to the reply. And I think the, the, the key here is not only that I listen to the reply, but that I'm faithful to what I understand in prayer. So if I'm praying about something and if I'm asking God about something and, he's, and you, you feel an answer in your heart, okay, you feel some sort of a, a direction being given. Follow that. So, well, I don't know. I don't really know if it was from God, or uh, I don't really know. I mean, I kind of feel maybe I should give up this certain TV program, or but I don't know if that message was from God. If you think it was from God, if you're fairly sure, just do it. Out of love for Him, do it. And the more you get used to doing what you feel the Lord is saying to you, the better you'll get at discerning it and the more Christ-centered your life will become. So if you feel this, I don't know, this is like, do you know, I go for a couple of drinks on the weekend, and uh, whenever I do, I uh, tend to get into these conversations with the guys about girls, and it all turns a bit, you know, uh, I don't really know, I don't know if I should, I don't know if I shouldn't. Pray about it, right? I, I think that the answer is going to be fairly swift and fairly clear on that one. And then if, once you have discerned then what God is asking you to do, do it. Do it. <laughs> Right, let's not over-spiritualize things. If there's something that, that you feel God is telling you to, to stop or to change, change it now. And then the next thing that comes up in your prayer and in your, discern in your discernment, do that too. And then you start to actually get good at recognizing his voice. And your life starts to actually change trajectory from a life that was, that was maybe not heaven-bound to one that's starting to head towards him. And now our, our, our faith isn't just... Uh, observation of certain rules but I'm allowing it into my heart and into my life and into my private life and into my thoughts and into my will that's a lived faith that's a relationship because now when Jesus says something to me I actually do it as opposed to saying well is that an absolute necessity or can I get away with it how much can I get away with 
What's the absolute minimum I have to do, Lord, to have a relationship with you? Any minimalist relationship is bound to fail. It's not, this is the, the goal shouldn't be, what's the, what's the minimum I have to do to get by here? But Lord, what can I do for you? What's the maximum? What, what, what are you asking me to do today? Would you be willing to give God a blank check, pre-signed with your name? Say, Lord, fill out whatever you need. A businessman would never do it. All right, if you're into your prophets and all of that kind of thing, you'd never give a signed blank check to someone. Would you trust the Lord with it? Would you trust Jesus with it? You give him this check and say, Lord, look, whatever you ask of me today, I'll do it. If it's my time, if it's some act of service, if it's something you want to prune out of my life and give up, Lord, I'm willing to do it because I trust you, because I love you. And even if I don't know you and trust you like I should, I want to give you this chance that we can grow, that I can grow in this relationship with you. I want to see you at work in my life. I want to give you the chance to show that you are God in my life and not just reduce our relationship to the, a minimum observation of, of, of some external laws. And then we'll begin to see a real transformation. We'll begin to see the reality of our gospel, of who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things came to be. Not one thing had its being, but through him. All that came to be had life in him. And that life was the light of men, a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness could not overpower. May the good Lord enlighten each one of us and our lives in this new year as we make our New Year's resolutions to put him back in the first place. Amen.